Hello, Namaskar. Welcome to P Guru's Prime Time. I am today with Jitendra Kumar Oja. The, today is Wednesday, Indocracy, Bharat Tantra. And today we are going to talk about the topic that has been raging for the past few days, Pegasus snooping. Is it good or bad? Is it a boon or a bane? So to hear all about this, we go and join, uh, we welcome Jitendra Kumar Oja ji. Jitendra ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar Shriji and thank you for having me on your channel. And uh, viewers, Jitendra Kumar Ojaji is a former teacher. In fact, he was a head teacher with his students being at mid and senior level in all security related departments in India and even many of the friendly countries of India. He's also the only Indian or Asian who's been lecturing commenting and writing on all dimensions of national security and a very wide area of geopolitics. So well placed to offer a big strategic picture with an impartial perspective on this Snoop Gate controversy. Thank you. Now the, the specific targeting of media and how credible is the claim of NSO that it is taking remedial measures given that they have been deplatformed by the Amazon web services. That means Amazon has basically shut off the spigot for NSO. So today they are not operational. Your take on what is this whole thing about? It's been going on for a long time. Why do we get outraged every time we hear that somebody was snooping on our conversation? Shri, I suppose ever since history has commenced, people have been eavesdropping, trying to understand and listen what is happening. But over the last 40, 50 years, we had come to a level where it was expected that all intelligence related activities, especially I'm talking about in democracies, that these are meant for a very specific purpose. And that specific purpose is national security. So very often, you know, snooping, etc., and espionage on domestic audience in democracies has been disapproved of. But uh, there has been a double standard, West and especially, you know, uh, you would know that uh, many uh, former CIA officers, they have jailed, they have been jailed also, including one former chief. Uh, they, they face prison term also. So it's a very contentious subject. But what is clear that intelligence has a very specific purpose, this kind of snooping, and that is security and stability of a country. But in some of the non-democracies and so-called rogue countries, also you can say, the regimes are very insecure. Like China, it is considered a surveillance state. It has been snooping on its own citizens out of apprehension that citizens may threaten its security and stability. So in case of India also, we have, uh, you know, so whether it's moon or bane you are asking, it works both ways. As long as snoop snooping is uh, carried out with certain ethical norms and the target of snooping are only those elements of uh, within your own society who threaten your state in a certain manner. And not only that, you just snoop, you come out with further remedial measures. You regulate and you see that, you know, the need for snooping, need for people, putting people under uh, surveillance reduces and increasingly lesser and lesser number of people have to face something of this nature. Why are we outraged? We are outraged in India, you know, there's a very specific context. When we are talking about ethical standards, when you are talking about professional standards, these are missing not only in uh, among people who are carrying out this snooping it is missing in general i'm not saying you know that all people are bad there are exceptionally brilliant people in all establishments in india exceptionally ethical people also but system as a whole you know here the chances of abuse of snooping is very very high not only high very very high and you know what worries most uh, uh, Sri, that this kind of data can pass on to adversaries of India. This kind of data, if it passes on to adversaries of India, then even the so-called rich and wealthy who are living under this comfort, you know, this sense of uh, security, that nothing is going to happen to them, even they will be vulnerable. Further worrying thing is that, you know, on your channel, I have said, and also in many of my lectures, that somehow our systems have been rigged, not now, but almost from the beginning. Despite securing independence, we, our systems have uh, ceded a lot of space to external actors. So what is going to happen that, you know, 
some of the international entities, global entities, Sri, they can exploit this data and they can jeopardize safety and security of anyone and everyone, given the laxity of system that we have internally and given the hostility that we are facing. So I think, you know, the, this is certainly, it can act to an advantage. Snooping can be used to a very good use for internal security. But in the prevailing circumstances, there are very serious apprehension that this snooping can jeopardize our national security. It can threaten virtually anyone and everyone without people being conscious of it because politicians have a very limited vision, all said and done. We don't have far too many statesmen in our, our stateswomen in our country. Reason is, as I said, it has been systems have been rigged. So they are so obsessed with their differences or their squabbles with their rivals that it is very difficult for them to see the larger picture. And even in bureaucracy, especially certain establishment, I'm very sorry to say that people with impartial vision, integrity, they are targeted most. I don't think that all this targeting is done uh, by personal rivalry or personal jealousy also. There are external factors who are keep an eye on you. At the moment they think, you know, that anyone is in a position to make a high impact, make a very powerful contribution, they alienate, they target. So in this snooping business, you know, what has happened? Some elements may appear legitimate. But, you know, people who are carrying out, you have to be aware that they also have a personal agenda. They also are beholden sometimes. And these things will never come in public domain. There will be no law to understand this thing. In the whole game of security, Sri, you have to stay two steps ahead of your adversary. But our whole system is, okay, you produce evidence. We don't trust anyone. But the entire ecosystem, if you watch, domestic as well as external, I think it is very dangerous. Snooping is not dangerous. The entire ecosystem, the infrastructure, the people, their professionalism, their integrity, their skills, whole thing is uh, substantially subverted under these circumstances, uh, Sri. I don't think there will be many beneficiaries of snooping. There are losses are far too high. But having said that, I don't discard need or necessity for snooping for purposes of national security or for purposes of detecting malicious elements within our society and isolating them. That need cannot be discounted. That need is permanent. But uh, uh, besides that need, you know, the chances of gross abuse of uh, this technology is very, very high. So in, let, let me draw some parallels here, Jitendra ji. If somebody's phone has to be tapped, whether it is a cell phone or their landline, uh, in the United States, the police or the investigative agency need to take the case in front of a magistrate, a judge, and tell them and prove it to the judge the severity of the problem this particular individual or entity poses as far as national security or any other such similar thing. Even a drug smuggling uh, crime is also considered something that is heinous enough that they need to be tapped. So this kind of a gate is always there that the judge has to sign off on this. How is it in India that uh, the judiciary is not involved in allowing tapping or is it that my understanding is wrong that every agency does need to do the paperwork of getting a judiciary authority to sign off on snooping. Look, in certain cases, the safeguards are there. But uh, my understanding and assessment is that, and I have never gone wrong on any major assessment treaty, that these safeguards exist only on paper. It, uh, it does not get translated into practice. There have been cases, you know, people have been speaking about it, and with a very valid reason, the snooping has been there, has been used by people to settle personal scores. Snooping has been used by unauthorized snooping has been used by scores of policemen, not only against uh, targets but against political entities or others, against businessmen, against politicians. You know, I don't want to share this thing, but you know, it has uh, uh, this experience is purely in my personal capacity. Once I was approached by a chief minister of a smaller state, you know, he came, uh, dropped by along with a friend. And uh, I started asking him, what has made you, you know, uh, come and visit? To me? what do and I owe was, the honor of this call? Yes, visit. Yes, because a politician is not going to waste his time. You know, as chief minister, I am someone who is, you know, uh, not that important. So then he told that he was being snooped upon and uh, he was being extorted. 
And this kind of snooping and extortion and this racket has been going on. This is one case. People have been blackmailed. So in a system where you, rule of law is very fragile, snooping has severe risk. And now the whole ecosystem is being vitiated in such a manner that, you know, moment you speak a voice, you are anti-national. And, and people who are claiming nationalism, they are all brokers, deal makers, and they are thoroughly corrupt themselves. You know, so instead of, you know, the rule of law being not strong, snooping or anything of this nature is more uh, vulnerable to abuse larger culture not having integrity this is going to be more vulnerable for abuse and that is why we are talking about uh, indocracy because this western model of democracy that we have uh, borrowed is not in a position to address our problems uh, shriji and this snooping can be used this technical surveillance high tech security equipments can be used to settle personal scores to breed conflict to one group can use it to overpower another group so it's not that only snooping is wrong. The entire ecosystem is so vitiated that, you know, these kind of things become far more dangerous. Now, what makes the politicians to hang on to their padvi or uh, chair for a lot longer than their use by date? Is it a fear that they have committed so many crimes that if they demit office, the, the successor will come and go after them? Or is it something else? I'm trying to understand this because I don't see anybody, any politician in India wanting to retire. <laughs> Not only politicians. In certain bureaucracies, certain departs, the entire chain of succession has been rigged. And despite best efforts of our honorable prime minister, it is difficult to detect. And why chain of succession? Same group of people who have been very a very strongly loyal to previous UPA regime, they continue to remain loyal to this government also because people have a lot to hide in India everywhere, Sri. And you know, if I say if 5% people, 10% people have something to hide, it means, you know, courts, laws, judiciary can take care of them. If 95% people have something or the other to hide, then, you know, something is wrong. And I used to hear a very absurd thing from someone, you know, I said that, look, I live with this, this uh, standard of integrity and whatever you wish to do, you can do. The person said, you know, look, rules and laws don't matter. Who has the power? That is what matters. So even if somebody is very innocent, I'm very much in a position to frame that person. And one of my former senior colleagues said, you know, no, no, you should not speak like this. It doesn't matter what is right and wrong. That is not the question. You know, people in position of authority have to be respected. People who are there, you have to be polite to them. So what I'm trying to say not only politician, everybody has something to hide. And what is my biggest worry, Sri, that in all democracies like ours, there are clandestine networks who never come on the front. Politicians sometimes could be proxies. I'm not talking at the highest level, but certain level politicians could be proxies. In certain cases, politicians also depend upon because of funding, this, that, or fragile security system, politicians or corporates, they also depend to some extent or to a higher extent to varying degrees to other clandestine forces. They are obligated to them. They are beholden to them and they have to look after their interests. And the only way to break this nexus, we felt, is a charismatic leadership that will build institutions, restructure everything, not as an act of charity towards people, but as a critical necessity for security, survival, progress and evolution of the world's oldest civilizations. But unfortunately, Sri, that uh, appears extremely difficult proposition at this point of time. And uh, what you are saying, your apprehensions are true. But I think only this is half of the larger picture. Now, um, you, you have situations like former prime ministers themselves have, uh, you know, put their own uh, party members sometimes under surveillance. Now, this is not something that is new. It's been happening for a long time. And uh, why the hue and cry now? So even if uh, the government today is uh, spying some people using software, so what? If you don't have anything to hide, what is your problem? No, no, I will answer this question in two, three phases. You said former prime ministers also had to put their people under uh, surveillance. You know, it shows that even prime minister 
when, of course, this is a very different situation, very robust majority, extremely powerful leader. This is a very different situation. But there were times when Prime Minister was also feeling insecure and threatened that, you know, the government could be toppled, people could be conspiring. And I think, you know, this is a problem that requires the solutions. Snooping is only an interim arrangement that you keep a tab on who's doing what. But then, as I said, intelligence is not to be used for political purposes within a government or within your country. Intelligence is a very thankless, dirty, distasteful work. It has to be done only in the interest of national security of a country. You can also argue, you know, I've seen politicians, I've been engaging them, that stability of government is a very critical aspect of national security. But I think we need to find a solution to this. Find a solution, it could be in multiple ways, that, you know, ensure that whosoever is prime minister, whosoever is chief minister, there's a fixed security of tenure, five years or ten years or whatever, two tenures. Once you've been elected, there will be no horse trading, no toppling of government, whatever it is. People will vote on the basis of certain uh, other thing and not on private agenda. But that is not happening. Our democracy had been subverted long back, long back, and these are after effects of this thing. You are saying, why now? Of course, this eavesdropping, this kind of snooping is a little more than snooping. Earlier, you know, the snooping was there only for political purposes. Now this, uh, I don't know, you know, as I understand last few years, you know, some vendors have been, uh, you know, or experts or this thing, they've, I've been speaking to them after retirement, etc., and trying to understand this subject, what all is available. Under this snooping, what happens, your camera, I'm told that my phone is also, Pegasus is there and I am not bothered, you know. So what I'm saying, that uh, this camera, even if the phone is switched off, the camera is working. Even if you're not talking, whatever is the background knowledge, that uh, background uh, sound, this is being recorded and kept somewhere. So what happens, you know, this is a highly obtrusive snooping. It completely destroys your privacy, even if you're there. So that is one thing. My worry is that, you know, Shri, I have always said that, uh, you know, we have technology. But when you have a technological innovation, a lot of advancement, your institutions also need to evolve. Your ideas, your thinking, everything also needs to evolve. But in this kind of thing, for me, what is going to what is going to be very bad, first apprehension I have, that the so-called loyalists of the government, they may be doing something, a part of the job for the political leadership. But what is the check or what is the safeguard that they are not doing 50, 60, 30, 40 or 70 percent of the snooping for their own illegitimate commercial purposes? If political leadership is accused of, you know, uh, uh, carrying out unethical things, moral authority or otherwise authority of political leadership also comes down. If these agencies, these people, they know that, okay, political bosses are doing these, these, these things, do you think that uh, they will not have their own business? That has happened and it has been happening. Only thing is that we are not in a position to speak on in public domain and all kinds of gag rule, gag laws, etc., which are being brought out is being done with a purpose to cover up criminality on part of these syndicates who are masquerading and hiding. In India, you know, I told you no know, news X. In India, at least in United States, intelligence is a very specialized profession. People undergo training for 18 months. They live in a bubble. An external internal dimension is completely segregated. How can you know when we say Anand Narayan Mullah said his comment is being, you know, reiterated 50 years later by Allahabad High Court that the biggest criminalized force in India is Indian police and nobody comes even closely second to that. Having said that, I don't say Devi, I have seen amazingly brilliant, legendary police officers who have, you know, withstood all pressures and large number of policemen are killed. What a dishonor it is to such patriotic, honest police officers that within those police establishments, these kind of criminalized elements exist. They endear themselves to every political establishment because they can bend backward, forward, sideways or anywhere. So what is uh, most worrying uh, in the whole thing? that, you know, this snooping could, is more vulnerable to be abused by, as I've said, by these compradors for absolutely anti-national purposes, Sri, and that is very threatening that in short term, political leaders, political executives may think, you know, it is beneficial to them, but in long term, it can destroy national security of India, very, give a severe blow to national security of India. Let us make not, no mistake. Neither United States nor Israel are committed to security of India and Indians. Indian state has to look after its own security and security of each one of its citizens. 
including the so-called 200 billionaires who are living under false impression that if India, something goes wrong in India, they will desert India. I can assure them also, look, parochial nationalism, this identity, everything is widely prevalent. As long as India is strong, you are safe, your dignity is safe and secure. But if something goes wrong, there will be problems. So this is what I feel, Sri, that yes, you and cry has not been uh, made earlier also, because in the world was not globalized. Our threats from neighboring, etc. were not very high. And it was bad. It was certainly bad. This kind of dirty activities only subverted our democracy. So if some people are talking about it, there has to be informed bipartisan discussion that politics is not war between two political parties. It is uh, something to provide governance. So I'm sure that if out of it, you know, we have high quality debate, something better will come out. So that should be objective, Sri. Now, uh, let me ask you a hypothetical, Jitendra Ji. Please. Let's say Prime Minister Modi uh, asks you and asks for calls you <coughs> and asks for advice in tackling some of these dynastic uh, political parties. There are 20 families, soon to be 21, from the looks of uh, uh, Mr. Chidambaram's uh, daughter-in-law also entertaining political ambitions now. I don't know why she has this colliery, but uh, be that as it may, from saving lives, she wants to influence lives now or better the lives better the lives they, they never say whose lives but uh, that is that is a conundrum that we know whose lives get better but um the, the, this so you, so if you were to advise prime minister modi on how to tackle some of these dynastic part, uh, pol parties how would you what would you say well i wish uh, shri he asked me and i'm able to render this advice to him He's relying on people, as you say, whose expiry date is long over, isn't it? So that is a problem because they have not uh, invested this thing and they themselves have some, some of them themselves may, may have lots to hide. So that is why, you know, he is being misguided. You see, when you tackle these domestic dissidents, isn't it? They're not enemies. You have to do it in such a manner that there is minimum of collateral damage and you silence them effectively. I have been looking outside. That's why, you know, some of my internal things are there. And I have converted my adversities also into an opportunity. So uh, people say, okay, you have, uh, in what position are you to give an advice when you yourself are not able to tackle it? I think, you know, what my adversaries did, they think they were inflicting damage on me, but that is working to my huge advantage, isn't it? So what I'm trying to say here, that there are a lot many ways, the kind of information which is available against all these dynastic cliques, that is sufficient. Some concession will have to be made by Prime Minister also, because he's not obligated to his party men also. There are crooks everywhere. And if you are genuinely committed to the country, you know, you bring about some structural reforms in such a manner. You see, somebody said you hit your enemy in such a way that, you know, even when he's being hit, he said, you know, I'm enjoying it. So there are multiple ways, you know, in which all these dynastic parties can be taken care of in next six months. And that is where you require you know, brilliant skill and also commitment, passion, insanity. And you should have traveled the distance in this world, this uh, this underworld. So I'm not getting into all details, but I can assure you, Sri, that in six months to a year's time, all these dynastic parties could be brought down to their knees. It is difficult for, you know, a average civil servant. Eight to nine years I have been in student politics also. And only reason I quit politics, you know, I was in a centrist politics for a party, student wing of centrist party for six months. I, I, I got, uh, you know, I've got a lot of mentors across political divide and a lot of brilliant things I learned from them. You know, had they not, uh, had I not been with them, you know, I think my knowledge would have been very limited. So one of them had said, son, if you can put your arm around someone and with a smile, if you can kill him, why waste your words? So, you know, so much of dirty things are there available about uh, them, you know, that can be used, Sri. And, you know, as, as I was saying, why did I quit politics, student politics? Because some money had come to that particular student wing, uh, you know, in my university, JNU, and some squabble had started. So one of my senior uh, uh, friends come advisors, I told him, some people were demanding money for uh, not political purposes, but for personal use. And he said, you know, this has been happening. People are being bribed virtually. You imagine that a political army is bribing to recruit its leaders and cadres. That, that was the reality. 
सो आई से पैसा बैंक में जमा करा तो ही सर कि ये ब्लैक मनी है तुम पागल हो गए हो ये बैंक में कैसे जमा करा सकते हैं सो आई से दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम यू नो इट्स फोर्टी ईयर्स प्लस वी हैव बिकम इंडिपेंडेंट इवन नाउ इफ वी हैव टू डिपेंड ऑन ब्लैक मनी देन इट इज शेम एंड आई सेफ यू शुड टेल द टॉप लीडर दो नंबर के पैसे से एक नंबर का काम कभी नहीं होता है isn't it so that was the day i decided i am not going to go on in uh, this thing so unfortunately we are going to be 75 years and we have not been able to resolve something of this nature there has certainly been crisis of leadership there has certainly been lack of spine at uh, various uh, levels not only in politics in our corporate sector in our intelligence in our bureaucracy that people think no 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 this is perfectly all right so what you are saying shri i think enough evidence is there you know by which you should not say you leave it you bring out a structural reform in such a manner ban nepotism details i will spell out if i am asked you said look one party you know dynastic succession in uh, leadership is banned in india because political party means you come together and you nominate your successor you you nominate four five successors somebody out of one should be elected and it should not be your own heir your own biological progeny there should be a clear gap of 5 years or 7 years or whatever you can say by that time one person succeeds another you know whenever there's a problem in society and there is a honest bipartisan and conscientious debate or discussion you try to find a solution but when you use freedom of speech and expression to rationalize your theft your criminality and silence the voices of a uh, bona fide legitimate dissidents you go down you know you go down in history and this is what you know we may not have silenced or oppressed people but we have been decaying for far too long and all these evils have come once again have crept back into our democracy i hope you know that somebody genuinely tells honorable prime minister i strongly admire him i don't worship him i admire him because i feel no human being is perfect human beings are vulnerable to follies each one uh, howsoever good a human being may be uh, you human beings are vulnerable to some frailties but i think it is very much possible to remove this dynastic uh, they saying not one i just mentioned one but 10 15 other issues are there you hold a bipartisan de debate and you show some of their deeds i'm sure they will happily walk away from political space of india and india will be on a different course entirely but uh, to conclude i will say opposition will not come only from these dynastic parties lot of dynastic cliques within his own party will also turn against him so that is where he has to be careful so the the dimension has increased now in the sense that before when there were only land lines to tap the tapping could be done by a government of its own subjects or perhaps even uh, people from other countries who may be taking up jobs in their embassies and things like that you could do that far now with um, you know uh, software like pegasus where you know one country can snoop on the leaders of another country which is what is being alleged in the case of france how does one you know protect oneself i mean today the opposition may be saying that it's the modi government that is snooping but there is no proof to say it is the modi government that is snooping and and the government is in a tricky situation if they say we are snooping they'll blame you if they say we are not snooping then they'll say what kind of security apparatus do you have right so how does one tackle this situation you know the most unfortunate thing which has happened shri that our prime minister he came with a very powerful vision you see his speeches initially and i can uh, share that in case of one gujarat government sir no, i had no idea i was working whatever uh, as, as a diplomat by the way not as anything else as a diplomat i had uh, uh, achieved something a, a major breakthrough uh, in a matter that pertained to gujarat government and moment he learned he wanted to meet me and say good words in kirish so imagine that you know his intent was absolutely bona fide genuine but you know i have a serious apprehension that people around him some people hiding here there and everywhere they have sabotaged and hijacked his agenda and they are doing all the misdeeds and everything is uh, you know they are holding him responsible somehow in some way or somewhere there's a very clever because i always assess tri that these forces about whom we are talking about they are very powerful forces they have a lot at stake they are not going to give up their stake their the thing so easily they would do anything and everything possible to protect what i say 
their market of organized crimes uh, and the way they are subverting our exploited institution, it empowers them, it nourishes them, it enriches them to such an extent. So they would not give it up. They try because of, uh, you know, lax system. So they have done uh, things like this. So what you're saying, yes, government is in a fix. Political leadership does not know. And somehow, whosoever has been advising political leadership, they, good number of them are planting stories of in media about their brilliance and greatness and everything. But anyone with a little bit of common sense, they could realize that, you know, they are failing. It's not possible because they are not that professional on these issues. A good advisor is one which also wants that, look, these are dangerous areas. These are red lines. These we need to avoid. This is how you need to negotiate. But what has happened, Sri, uh, as uh, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit, and I'm, but still I'm telling that, you know, that kind of uh, space has not been there for intellectual thinking or deliberation on how to strengthen India, how to build national security. All the great experts I come across, you know, and sometimes get disappointed. Discussions even at Chatham House were confined to who is going to win election. But there has not been, except for your platform, you are one person and one or two other people who are interested. How can we transform governance? How can we translate or rather realize latent potentials of India? There has not been much discussion. So I think, you know, that it is very unfortunate situation that uh, government has been pushed into. And a lot of uh, this opportunity which we had received, India as a country had received, a powerful, charismatic uh, leader who broke the stranglehold of a dynastic clique or party. Congress was a political party. With uh, all due respect to Pandit Nehru, he was a great visionary man, but not a perfect man with all his follies were also there, one has to discuss. But most unfortunately, that political party was converted from party to a syndicate by a group of courtiers, one of the courtiers you have named. And they subverted democracy of India. I think, you know, the larger ecosystem was so much vitiated, Sri, that it became very difficult for uh, our prime minister, when he, present prime minister, when he inherited things. These are challenges. All I hope, you know, that these kind of challenges open up ways for some progress, some improvement, but it is not going to be easy, as I said earlier also. So le let me ask you a hypothetical again. So now it is a given that high-tech security firms, they are not necessarily based in India, that they can snoop any country or anyone for that matter across the world. How do you convert this into a boon for India or any other country? You know, sometimes what happens is you don't let a crisis go waste. You try to do the best you can to try and turn it into an advantage. Any thoughts on how India can convert this into a boon instead of a bane? Look, uh, you know, there are all kinds. We are living in a globalized world and this kind of snooping, you know, uh, has been carried out by NSA of United States uh, long back, you know, and this has come in media, some people question the Americans themselves, they question the ethical dimension of this snooping. But right now, this kind of snooping is there. So if you see how can we convert it? Firstly, I would say, you know, whatever equipment, etc. is there, research has to be carried out within the country and not only snooping, but a very high quality, high tech, uh, uh, you can say research in uh, building a high tech security cover. But when you're building high tech security cover, you also need to change two things, your structures of state, and society, larger culture in society. I have said, you know, reform in one institution is impossible without simultaneous reform in other institutions. One or two or three or four healthy institutions can bring up other institutions. If some institution has healthy institution has a high level of energy and intensity, it can induce such positive changes in other institutions also. So I think, you know, if we want to, we have to be aware of this thing. If we are not souping, others will soup. This has come up about so-called Indian state uh, through uh, an Israeli software snooping upon its own citizens. Very sad. And good number of people are very uh, unfortunate. They have nothing as such uh, that they deserve snooping by any other thing. But do you think that uh, our adversaries are not snooping upon us? Do you think that this data which is being collected here and there will not be used against us? So this snooping will go on. What we have to do is we have to build a stronger defensive and offensive capacities. If there is a malicious snooping within the country or from outside the country, and that malicious snooping has an advantage, uh, disadvantage of, you know, eroding our security, we should be in a position to defend as well as disintegrate 
and attack uh, those, those uh, adversaries also. You know, we have not allowed high quality R&D institutions to come up, not uh, in absolute terms, but as per our potential. I have always mentioned even on your channel and so many channels that there are so many powerful lobbies within India. They have not allowed indigenous defense manufacturing to come up in India because it is far more easier, they are lucrative it is for them, you know, to procure uh, things from outside. So I think, you know, there will be no shortcuts. Firstly, we have to regulate and ensure that our intelligence agencies and institutions, they are professional. These are manned by skilled people. These are manned by people who are ethical. I said in one debate in India, we are only democracy which does not have an intelligence oversight committee and a lot of other things about police people, how they have, uh, and other society, people who are not living in that bubble, they have come and they are, uh, they can be doing immense harms. And they are also trying to silence legitimate voices of dissidents, which are calling for progress, which are calling for reform, which are calling for better national security. Because in these cases, others may not see, but the picture is very clear that some of them are beholden to some external entities and they are working more as compradors. This is very much possible. Anywhere checks and balances are missing, Shri, people will tend to go rogue. So that is why, you know, and especially when they are working in non-transparent uh, ambient, it's extremely important. It's extremely, we are not Pakistan, we are not China. We are a responsible country. So it is extremely important that we ref we improve and refine all institutions within the country. The rot which is there of the so-called people who have flourished and thrived in this system, each one of them have something to, to you know, hide. So we have to give them some kind of exit, not allow them to decamp with the booty, but give them some kind of exit and realize that it's not one issue that we are talking about. The larger consequences of this snooping would be disastrous. You see how we are becoming increasingly irrelevant in Afghanistan and long term this will impact our security. How we have failed to play a role or rather bring United States, America, uh, uh, United States, uh, Russia and China on the same page and see that we are strong here. How we have not been able to conclude a covert war in Kashmir by a much lesser adversary. So fact is that, you know, this kind of thing misplaces your priority, misplaces your agenda, because politician all said and done is in the game to win elections. <clears throat> so that is why I say that we need integrity, professionalism and excellence in those institutions. And that is where there has to be a bipartisan debate. And that space for bipartisan debate appears increasingly shrinking, uh, Shri. I hope that we, we, we learn something out of it and we become wiser. Well, to add to your point, uh, Jitendraji, um, P. Gurus was one of the first to publish the template of how a deal, when it is imported from abroad, goes down. Who are the stakeholders? How much of the pie do they get as cut? And so on and so forth. For example, this all is uh, uh, detailed uh, very extensively in Augusta Westland uh, Chopper deal. And, uh, you know, the fallout of all that was the person who put together the deal, the UPA government actually uh, uh, um, uh, made the person who put together the deal, he's a very corrupt person, he, he became the controller, controller and auditor general of India. So there is, you know, th this corruption is also being rewarded actively by these people. And, and you ask any one of them, they'll say, oh, but there is nobody has been acted upon. Why? Because they have their own people everywhere throughout the system. I'll give you a simple example. There is a personal lawsuit against Mr. Chidambaram and two finance minister, finance ministry officials for what they did in the period from 2012 to 2014 or something like that. It was in UPA period. Today, those two ex-finance ministry officials, their expenses, lawsuit expenses, are being paid by the government. These people are long retired. The government shouldn't be paying that thing. You, for example, who don't have that luxury. You are, you, are, you are indulging in lawsuits. You don't have that luxury. Why should these people be? Because they are special. They are Chiddu's people. They are C company employees. These are rats. I tell you, and, and, and crooks of the highest order, I'm sure they are listening, at least for one second, let it sting them. 
because the government it's hasn't been able to touch them. them. Ah. The government hasn't been able to touch them. I've written books about it. All I can do is tell everybody NDTV frauds, Augusta Westland, Hairsal Maxis, INX Media. I can go on and on. P Gurus has given tomes and tomes of data. The government doesn't do anything. So clearly, these people have placed effective, uh, what I call as obstructors, to to not let the process of justice to proceed. Right. So the same kind of thing is at play even when it comes to national security, isn't it? So at some point, somewhere, the appointment of the top person, like the top uh, spy or the top cop or the top uh, income tax inspector, they have to grow a spine and they have to be told by the top man who is elected by the people saying, even if I tell you to do something, don't do it unless you get a written order from me. How hard is this? It's very difficult, you see, you know, I should not be saying some place, you know, I was seeing that all infrastructure was being pilfered, you know, so people said, you know, uh, some articles were brought in and those articles disappeared. So I told in an open meeting, even if you say that, you know, we should an order that this article uh, has to come to my house, you will pay from your pocket and the accountability was fixed. Still, you know, those people were corrupt. They will try to bring one or the other story. Difficult. If you try to do that, you will be knocked out of your system. I told you, you know, how one cabinet minister of present government only, he's sadly no more, uh, and a man considered to be very clean, thrice he comes to me, and he said, you know, you can decide to be honest, but you can't dictate who all should be honest. And some of my adversaries you are talking about, they said, you know, he was trying to break the system. And what is the system? System is you be corrupt and you continue to be with this thing. If you are not uh, this thing, you are trying to. And this has been happening for n number of ages from pre-independence India. Even when General Dyer, he ordered uh, his uh, policemen to fire upon you know, unarmed civilians, couldn't those policemen have returned and fired upon him? No, they didn't do that. So this psychological culture has been there for too long. You are saying, you know, one person and having spine. It's not possible, Sri. Uh, some friends are, you know, for some reason, uh, you know, they are fighting. Big lawyers are fighting my case pro bono and three and a half years. In India, judiciary is gold plated and justice does not exist for all for 99 percent cases because judicial process has been made so expensive. So I don't want to say this is why we are saying, you know, we are trying to tell our elite also that, look, Fine, you may think that today security of ordinary man is uh, under threat or some some people is under threat, but security of everyone is under threat. If India does not remain strong, security of everyone will uh, be under threat. When Rana Sangha invited Babur, he did not know what will happen to his descendants, isn't it? Similarly, when Jachand invited uh, Mohammed Ghori, he did not know what will be the consequences. When Mir Jafar struck a deal with East India Company, he did not know what will happen with them. So fact is that, you know, people are thinking that the security has come for free. And it's not only intent that matters. It's a much larger picture, Sri. Unfortunately, you know, this culture has been has vitiated. It is certain things are wrong in our DNA. Certain things are extremely good with us also. But I don't think that the solutions you are saying are going to be that easy. Solutions will take a lot of time. It will need when we will need to build a larger culture of integrity and leadership and regarding these people, you have said, you know, I will say one report of, uh, you know, I keenly read these reports and some of these reports are beautifully written by American think tanks and agencies. So DNI, Directorate of National Intelligence, uh, I remember many years back, you know, some of its reports uh, come in public domain. Very knowledgeable people, they write it. Sometimes people who do their dirty work is a different set, maybe different set of people. But this uh, report had mentioned how clandestine networks work with swiftness, with agility, with flexibility, and they can take over institutions. They will not choke you entirely, but they will create, you know, what should I say, elements in your own institutions who for their personal agenda will work for uh, betterment of someone else. Defense deals you mentioned. Sri, there are n number of credible researchers which have said that six, from 1960s and 70s, not a single defense deal in any of the developing countries has been clean and beneficiaries, the bigger beneficiaries are not members of uh, those developing nations, but somebody from those countries itself. 
So even if you know India secured independence, we said decolonization, but clandestine colonization, clandestine loot of our resources has been going on. So very often we say that, you know, when West is talking about democracy, many cases they are shedding crocodile tears. Many times they decimated democracy. They scuttled elected regimes for whatever reasons in the name of national interest. But Somehow that deeper thinking has not gone. And this is where I see in India, amongst Indian, with wise and intellectual people like you all over the India, we have produced so many CEOs. It is time we start talking about legitimate, bona fide, good democracy. And we not only talk, we try to set up a healthy democracy. This is crucial for security of not only Indians. This is crucial for security of all people all across all divides. So this is what my hope is. But I think, as you said, system is terribly rich. It's not going to be that easy. But our effort is maybe just a minuscule, minor effort. But I hope, you know, more people join. More people are inspired. They compete with us and they do better things. But uh, I'm not all that optimistic, Sri. I'm not all that optimistic. But still, we are trying. Yes, indeed. But you also notice that social media is now beginning to play an important role in trying to hold people accountable. So all our viewers, whenever you feel outraged about a black and white um, misappropriation of money, corruption, even if supposing you know you find that somebody is being anti-national, you need to bring this out in the open. And hopefully that sort of starts opening people's eyes and they are forced to act. And this is the only way to bring about a correction in the system where 95 percent is compromised you wanted to say something sir before we wind up yes you see you know human beings are designed to think and act in the most selfish manner and what has happened this surveillance this snooping has empowered some of them to do what to still keep people under servitude but uh, through your program i would tell elite of india highly educated uh, indians even outside that look, a stronger India is needed for their own security as well. So it's not that only ordinary people should be fighting for a better world. We need a larger leadership driven vision where those who are in position of leadership, they harness and channel energies of everything to build a fairer society, a just society, Sri. Thank you. Thank you very much. And viewers will be back again next Wednesday to listen to uh, Jitendra ji on more uh, topics related to Indocracy and Bharat Tantra. Thanks for watching. Do click on the bell button. That is the notification that tells you that when there is a new video of P Gurus on YouTube, you can immediately go and start watching it. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Namaskar.